The BC boys came to play on Sunday in Sunrise. We discussed the Florida Panthers' 4-3 win over the Blackhawks. How coaches approach facing Connor Bedard. And a rumor that just won't go away for the Florida Panthers' pursuit towards the playoffs. Your Locked On Panthers, your daily podcast on the Florida Panthers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into this special crossover edition of the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast and Locked On Chicago Blackhawks podcast. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. Thank you for making the Locked On Florida Panthers and Locked On Blackhawks your first listen of the day. For everyone on the Blackhawks feed, let me introduce myself. My name is Armando Velez from the Hockey News and the host of Locked On Panthers. You can follow me on X at Man 12 Follow the show account on X and Instagram at LO underscore FLA Panthers. And very thankful to be doing yet another crossover with the host of Locked On Blackhawks, my very good friend, and thankful to be doing this even 24 hours after the final buzzer back from Sunday afternoon, Jack Bushman, the host of Locked On Blackhawks. Jack, great to be getting together with you once again, my friend. Yes, Armando, I'm glad. I know uh, I was my bad apologies for not being able to get something out yesterday after the game wrapped up, but Better late than never, as they say. Glad to be here with you once again. And uh, unfortunate, though, that this will be the last meeting between these two teams this season. In the past couple years, it's felt like we've gotten one in the fall, one in the spring that we could kind of look forward to. The Blackhawks have just got gotten a really weird early schedule this season. Two meetings within a week or within eight days of each other between the Blackhawks and the Panthers. They have a similar situation with the Tampa Bay Lightning, who they face on Thursday. So kind of unfortunate that this is going to be uh, our last chat as a crossover of our two teams facing off with one another. But always good to be talking hockey with you, my friend. I wish these teams played a little bit more often, taking us back to our uh, COVID 2020 four divisions when the Blackhawks yeah. and the Panthers faced off a lot of times. But I'm doing well, my friend. Always happy to be chatting puck with you how are you doing i'm doing i'm doing fair fairly well uh for, for sure and hey what we might not be talking on a crossover but definitely over text and all that uh stuff uh, outside of outside of the podcast but de- definitely well after the panthers are nine four and one i couldn't be happier after getting off the stanley stanley cup final and all but let's just go right into this game man uh the florida panthers they they uh it, it, as far as as this game like Never trailed in this one. Go go up one one nothing and all. Uh, very early on in the in this one, and for for the Panthers, what I felt in this game was the fact that I think the main difference in this one was the fact that the puck was moving fast and that the, it wasn't held on the stick. You weren't seeing a lot of handling and waiting for things to develop as well for for the Panthers in the I, uh, offensive zone the cycle chances for the Panthers were just incredible after period two it was nine nothing cycle chances uh, created for the Panthers in, in period after two periods as well and that's really I feel that the difference was for the for the Panthers as far as the goals against for the Panthers I I, th- I felt like it was some mental errors the one that uh, Dickinson had got got through the got to the boards uh, deflected off Kulikov's stick, and then Dickinson's there as, as the Panthers were a little bit frozen on that. And then Connor Bedard, those those two goals that he had, Ekman Larson had a stick on it, and then gets it under, and then Bedard with that steal on uh, Kevin Stenland to get the get that goal uh, to make it three three at the time. A lot of it's funny because even though it was back and forth, I I still felt that the Panthers were just dominating the game, especially that top line. Uh, Corsi four percentage was twelve to four, I believe, in in, in this one. Uh, um, for, uh, in, at five on five, and even for the Panthers, that top line they're continuing to set the tone. Only two goals against on the season at five on five. The top line of Evan Rodriguez, Sasha Barkov, and and Sam Reinhart, who got a four point night. The BC boys, like I said at the top, came to play. Sam Reinhart from West Vancouver, and then Connor Bedard from North Vancouver. <laughs> How did you see uh, this game unfold for the Blackhawks from your perspective? Yeah, it was. Um... 
one of those where it felt like they didn't get off to a dreadful start despite giving up a goal a minute and 17 seconds in or whatever it was. But it just felt like they really struggled to sustain any puck possession or it really felt like they couldn't want, they couldn't retrieve it. And when they did, they couldn't hold on to it. It felt like the Florida Panthers bullied them a little bit. They were bigger. They were better with the puck on their stick and they deserved to win this game. Um, the Blackhawks came with a decent push. I, you could say in the final five or six minutes, but really from the start of the second period until like the, the 10 minute mark of the third, it was all Florida Panthers. So they definitely were the better team. Uh, they deserved to win this game. But what happened was Connor Bedard was just in the right position to make plays. The Blackhawks didn't generate that many high danger scoring opportunities. They didn't get that many scoring chances, but when they did, they just were pretty lucky to have Connor Bedard be the one in those spots. Uh, one of those, he obviously made the play himself, forcing that turnover from Kevin Stenland. The other, just a little bit too much room to give him in the offensive zone. And I don't know if you saw the uh, the little clip that got posted on X, but he actually knocked that puck right out of midair when he was going on his release. That was pretty special. So, yeah, Connor Bedard was really the the biggest takeaway from from uh, the Blackhawks perspective in this one, because they just didn't really play all that well. And that's kind of been the theme for them so far this season, right? Is um, they've had some big wins, but it's kind of been trouble for them to string together consecutive wins. They can show, they can have some, some good performances and can come with some good fights, but that's kind of been the biggest hurdle for this young group is getting through that, that break, breaking through that wall and stringing some together here. So um, I wish they performed a little bit better in the in the middling points of that game when it was still in the balance and they didn't have to, you know, come with a desperate push late. But um, I, it wasn't also their worst performance of the season, but it was a pretty clear reminder to me of where this Blackhawks team still is and when they go up against teams who are capable of doing really good things as a whole. And obviously the Panthers are coming off a Stanley Cup final berth. It was pretty evident that they were just uh, – a more physically demanding team and were harder on the puck. And that's why, in my opinion, they came out with the win in this one and got some redemption after the Blackhawks were able to uh, take it to them the weekend prior on home ice with your boy in attendance. Yeah. And uh, just uh, for, for that last matchup, just that first period just really, uh, really gave the Panthers no chance in winning that previous matchup. But in this one, Sam Bennett comes back after only playing one period against the Boston Bruins and gets uh, tied up with Hampus Lindholm. Uh, misses the next uh, uh, six games for the Panthers returns 16 minutes and 51 seconds, a little bit of a mixed bag gets two penalties on, on, on the night. One of them with a holding as a stick, which a little bit debatable on, on that one, in my opinion, but, uh, but for, for the, for the pan, for, but his physical presence was definitely missed for, for, the, and he set the tone like right before the first TV timeout on, on Lucas Reichel and, and all. And you get a, you get a big cheer from the crowd because it's also creating more balance as far as the forward line, putting Anton Lundell back on that third line and all, and Kevin Stenlin back on that fourth line with uh, Ryan Lomberg and Steven Lorenz and all that. And you think, and I think that with the, with the Panthers and their, and, and their big bodies that, that reinforcements and all, and also with the injuries that they're facing. I mean, you, you think about guys who are just very opportunistic on, on, on their, on their chances, all of Reckman Larson uh, getting that power of that, that gold, like, less than a minute in to to the game this is also the first game that the florida panthers have had two power play goals in the same game their their power play has struggled this season i mean new guys as well uh carter um evan rodriguez is no longer on the first power play unit as well um getting shifted down to power play too so they're doing a little bit of of, of different units as far as that for for the panthers as, as well so and the penalty kill six out of the last eight games for for the panthers not giving up a, a power play goal uh they started the first seven games with giving up one each game, and now it's it's gone, it's gone from 32 in the last week and a half to now 21st. So it's a lot of improvement for 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 the Panthers uh, there there as as well. So definitely definitely good signs for the Panthers, and they are doing it in front. They did it in front of a crowd of 19,359 on an NFL Sunday. Yeah, the Dolphins were on a bye. Yeah, the, the Bears <laughs> played on Thursday night football, but still. Just what that Stanley Cup final has brought, and the energy that's brought to this region, it's just uh, it's just incredible uh, for for that. And Sam Reinhart named first star of the week with ten points in four games, and and is second in the NHL in in in, in goals, uh, tied for second, right behind Austin Matthews. Just you, you got you got to give credit to the to the coaching staff, 
Bill Zito, especially the find that Evan of Evan, not necessarily a find. People knew who he was the last few years. Get getting on, get getting continuously getting on the score sheet as well. Two assists on the night. Got high stick twice, and I was just like, oh man, uh, he okay. that guy was getting beat up uh, up there. But still, with uh, with how they were able to just continue that top line continued to drive play, and and spe- especially with their back checks, just gotta gotta be fairly pleased a, a, as well. Yeah, that was another big takeaway that I had. It felt like what added to the Blackhawks not being able to generate any momentum or continuous puck possession uh, was that they took way too many penalties. That's been a little bit of something that's haunted them as well. And they're just not a team that's meant to be coming from behind the eight ball and to be coming back. They're, They're not really built for that. So taking so many penalties and then also not having the power or the penalty kill come up big when they needed them to. I thought that was also huge. And in a game where, you know, their two of their three goals came via counter Bedard and they would have liked to hold the Panthers down more. It doesn't help when you're taking, I think they took five penalties total in that one. So not a, not a great disciplined game from the Blackhawks kind of wound up costing them. Yeah. One of them, including a double minor by uh, Nick Foligno after that hit, but that Kulikov had on, on a Bedard. And I, I think the one that really changed the game was uh, when Dickinson went after, uh, went after Kulikov in the neutral zone. It's like, yeah, that hit happened in the previous period, but man, it's got to be, it's just a little bit of a mental error uh, there for, for uh, uh, Dickinson there that, that the Panthers were able to cash in after, after that and all, but we're going to transition over to segment number two, where we're going to discuss more about how coaches and players are just viewing the Connor Bedard experience. And from playing against him, we are going to discuss that and more here on the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast and Locked On Chicago Blackhawks podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. And passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Segment number two here on this Special crossover edition of the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast and Locked On Chicago Blackhawks podcast. Thank you once again for making both of our podcasts your first listen of the day. And for it's just it's just incredible what just the two games that that I got to experience seeing the team that I cover face against uh, Chicago Blackhawks and Connor Bedard. That breakaway goal in the first game um, where. The Panthers were dominating that period. They dominated the last two periods in, in the in the first matchup. But then you make one mistake. He goes on a breakaway. And everyone and their mother knew that Conor Bedard was going to find a way to beat Anthony Stolarz back eight, eight days prior to the, to the matchup on Sunday. And then look what happens uh, on, on, uh, on uh, Sunday. You give him space. You give him his speed. That he can score from a wrister. A one-timer. He almost tied the game in the final minutes before... Sergey Bobrovsky had his pads down. It's like, oh, it's scary when the puck is on his stick. But here's also one thing I want to highlight from what Paul Murray said about his team playing against Connor Bedard. He was asked, are you glad that you guys don't get to play Connor Bedard again? He actually did not say no. He said that when you play against a talent like coming into the league, a rookie phenom, it actually helps you adjust your game a lot better and get has you has you learn more about the game. And it's not every year that someone gets labeled as generational talent and all. Like like Connor. I mean, almost <laughs> like I don't know his exact stats from Regina last year, but I believe it was two points a game somewhere around there. But it, it's it, it's it's crazy what the experience what how what the respect is 
from other coaches saying about the adjustments to to playing against them and just we're going to see so many years of this how how has as far as what other coaches said about adjustment style and also the Connor Bedard experience, how has that been as far as how players have adjusted to like respecting his game on the ice? Because he almost has 10 goals and we're not even at the 20 game mark yet. Yeah. And what's been crazy too, Armando is I feel like coaches have been giving him a, a pretty fair amount of respect because the Blackhawks early on this season, their first, I mean, they're still going through it right now, but their first eight games, I know 11 of their first 13 were against teams that qualified for the Stanley Cup playoffs last year. And right out of the gate, opening night against the Pittsburgh Penguins, he's facing Sidney Crosby. Next night against the defending Stanley Cup champion Vegas Golden Knights in their home opener, he's going against Jack Eichel in their top line. Against the Toronto Maple Leafs, he's going up against Austin Matthews. Like He's having to face the music really early on, in part because he's playing as the top line center for the Chicago Blackhawks as well. But I feel like that's in part of what's led to this kind of ascension that we've seen from him through these first 13 games. He's really, I felt like taking a big step in this last five or six where early on he was just kind of figuring out what he needed to do and what he could do out there. And now it's just like, he's realized what it takes and now he's piecing it all together to take over. So I think it's been interesting that right out of the gate, he faced, opposing teams top lines and I almost feel like that kind of added to him and his development and learning a little bit more and I feel like coaches if they're not putting their top defensive lines against Connor Bedard and even if they are like he has the abilities to make you pay and I think the biggest standout thing about him Armando has been how grindy of a special and elite player he is like we know about the speed and the goal scoring and the shooting mechanics that wrister that he has and the playmaking to go along with it but the dude is gritty. Like he can, even though he's five foot nine, doesn't, I mean, he's shredded, but definitely not over 200 pounds. He is scrapping out there and clawing his way and had a goal the other night where he got inside position on Victor Hedman. Never heard of him. He's a pretty good defenseman. Like he's Has doing, to his name. Yeah. He's going out there and he's, he's stripping Kevin Stenland. He's forcing turnovers and now calling his own number. And it feels like He's really learning and piecing it all together here right in front of our eyes. And it's a real beautiful thing, but I am curious as to how teams now that he, I mean, nothing has really changed except the finished product. We all knew he was a special talent. There's been this buzz around him for reasons. I'm interested to see how much teams are going to ramp up the physicality aspect on him because we saw it in this game with Dmitry Kulikov and mm. we've seen him be tested a couple of times. I mean, we've already played the Boston Bruins twice and Brad Marchand, Brad Marchand. <laughs> Brad Marchand's pulling his same old BS and Connor's just sitting there smiling. But I, I am curious, like that's, that's going to be the next big test for him because it's still early on in the season. Right. I mean, big hits do happen, but those are things that later on in the season and when games become more meaningful, which they're probably not going to be for the Blackhawks this year, but that's still going to be the next very interesting step these next few years as the Blackhawks are trying to reach that level once again. And I'm really curious to see how teams are going to handle him physically because it feels like that's really the one area where people can say, oh, he doesn't have the size. He is a little bit smaller. We can at least try to make life tough on him to slow him down a little bit, right? So I'm curious if we're going to start seeing more of that if this success continues to pile up like we've seen these last couple of games as he's now uh, picked up two goals in, in the last two in a row here. Yeah, and I'm I'm interested to see what now what what the divi- what the division in the central does when the guys who do see him more often and how they adjust yeah. to that game as well. And I think that's the con as far for a Florida Panthers perspective on not seeing him play as as often is is what how they how they adjust and like you said the physicality on all you we brad marchand it was mostly just messing with him it's like hey rookie welcome to the league it's not necessarily like pushing him or shoving him it's just like hey i'm standing here you're not gonna get any movement so just his antics and and also the defensive play of um of conor Bedard as well he almost broke up that first goal by oliver ekman larson in 39 seconds in and just he's a hair more that's not even a goal by Oliver Ekman Larson there to, to start the game. And who knows how the momentum could have carried uh, for, for, for that one as well. So I'm really interested to, to see as far, as far as that. So that, that's just, uh, it's just when, when you have someone who could just <laughs> battle of, uh, against the Norse trophy defenseman and Victor Hedman, I mean, that, that's just, 
and and the dangles as well and and just the deception with his hands it's like so many different things in one that he could do it feels like that he doesn't have a weakness out there yeah i mean and that's kind of been the biggest surprise to me too was how well he's handled like the defensive aspects and how many turnovers he's forced and how good he's been in breaking up plays and He's not only just a heads up offensive player and has a high hockey IQ when the puck's on his stick, he thinks the game at a fast level while defending at the same time too, and has some good stick checks and good poke checks and is just being in the right spots. That's kind of been one of the greatest uh, or biggest um, pleasant surprises, I guess you would say about Connor Bedard. Like we knew the offensive talent was all there and it was just a matter of him putting it all together, which we've seen recently, but defensively he's been one of the best for checking forwards for the Blackhawks this season as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely is definitely, you're definitely going to see a lot of uh, growth in his game. And it's just the fact that he's already at this rate in year number one, not going to say uh, the Calder trophy race. Is not necessarily over at this point in time? But I think we know where it's, the, where it's headed as far as the expectations and and him putting it, the performance out there on, on the ice and the fact that one one guy from British Columbia uh, performed well in the two goals and then Sam Reinhart getting his two one off a double deflection uh, the, one of them off Nick Foligno uh, and then <laughs> Sam Reinhart getting the defle- another deflection there and then uh, late later into to the game. Uh, he he get he he banks it in off uh, Soderblom as well. So the the guys from British Columbia definitely uh cl- came to play on, on the night as as well. So de- definitely uh definitely wish that the Panthers could play the Blackhawks more often so we could see more of the Connor Bedard show for sure. But we're gonna transition over to segment number three where we're gonna discuss a rumor that just won't go away as far as the Panthers' pursuit of a specific player. That maybe Jack, he might be familiar with this guy. Might, you know, might. So we we're going to discuss this and more here on this crossover edition of the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast and Locked On Chicago Blackhawks. First, I need to let you all know that today's episode is brought to you by Sleeper. The NHL season is finally here. Are the Vegas Golden Knights going to reign supreme once again? I don't know. The Chicago Blackhawks found a way to beat them in their own building, so that's probably not a good sign. In all seriousness, though, I love the NHL. I love hockey, and I know all you listeners and viewers out there do as well, and that's why I'm here to talk to you all about Sleeper. Sleeper is my go-to platform for daily fantasy sports, especially daily fantasy hockey, because with Sleeper, you have the chance to win 100 times your cash on daily fantasy sports, and the NHL has literally never been as exciting and filled with as much talent as it is right now with superstars like Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, Nathan McKinnon, Kale McCarr, Sidney Crosby, and Alex Ovechkin are still around, of course. And then we got our boy Connor Bedard here in Chicago. And all you need to do with Sleeper is simply select more or less based on their stats provided, such as goals, assists, points, saves, and more. And again, Sleeper offers 100 times cash payout. So start paying attention, make the right picks, and you could win real big right now. Entries can be made in under 30 seconds, and Sleeper is currently live in 28-plus states. And you can also go and use the promo code listed down below. That's locked on NHL in all caps, and you'll get up to an $100 match on your first deposit. Again, that's promo code lockdown NHL in all caps, and you can go and see Sleepers Terms of Use for more details. Third and final segment here on this crossover edition of the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast and Locked On Blackhawks. Thank you once again for making the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast and Locked On Blackhawks your first listen of the day. So, you know, casually just scrolling my timeline at work today uh, <laughs> as, you know, with the Panthers, they, they have a lot of hard decisions coming for, for their for the roster. William Lockwood has been sent down to AHL Charlotte. Yona G- Jakovic is looking to return to the Florida Panthers, so their roster is going to be at 23. Brandon Montour is going to be a full participant skating. Then it's going to be up to the doctors as well, uh, whether he returns later this week. But there's... Even there's probably an even harder, not not as hard of a decision. But if if this even happens, 
because there's this one rumor that just won't go away. And the latest is with a former Blackhawk, Patrick Kane, who uh, who is coming off the hip resurfacing uh, surgery that he had uh, earlier in the offseason. We know that he wasn't the healthiest when he was traded from Chicago to New York. Uh, it, we saw it definitely in his performance. But the latest thing from Elliot Friedman was this, quote, Bill Zito has been one of the most aggressive general managers when it comes to Patrick Kane. They don't have a ton of money, but he is like the salesperson that calls you during dinner. He's been aggressive with Kane, close quote. And the 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 word was always the rumors were always going to be November. That was going to be the time where he felt that he was going to be fully healed, going to sign with the team. But I still have my doubts about the money aspect of it for Patrick Kane. I think he would need to take league minimum and also just a little bit perspective as far as rules as far as signing him because he did not turn 35 before the season starts it is not a 35 plus contract that he will be signing so there's another thing but i i, I don't know how it's going to come off the re, um, hip resurfacing because of get um, um nicholas backstrom uh, went through it ed jovanowski former panther also went went through it as well and currently patrick kane how how are how is how are you viewing this whole situation on Patrick Kane's injury from going to elite of the elite former number one overall pick? We spoke about one. Now we're talking about another. Probably the greatest American skater to ever uh, to ever suit in the NA, to ever put on an NHL jersey, and now possibly a chance to sign with the Florida Panthers. I don't think it happens. I still think if Buffalo finds a way to get some wins because he's from there and Detroit, weirdly question mark. Uh, how are you viewing this by the way? Uh, it is an interesting time, a hundred percent for sure. Um, and yeah, you mentioned there were people that, and teams that knew everyone knew that Patrick Kane wasn't healthy when the New York Rangers went and acquired him last year. That was actually a, an injury that kind of been lingering around for a couple of years. He had just found some ways to play through it. And last season was just really, um, the final straw in terms of he's not able to get it done anymore unless he undergoes this procedure. So I felt like it was something that was only a matter of time, but what I think is really unfortunate is people took that last season that he had with the Blackhawks and what he did last year with the Rangers. I know he was disappointing and didn't come through for them. Like they were hoping to, he just couldn't, he just wasn't healthy. He wasn't able to move the way that he wanted to in order to create like he does out there on the ice and to open up that separation where he makes those heads up feeds and where he's at his best. He wasn't able to perform at that level. And I think it makes people forget what this guy is still capable of doing. I mean, the year prior, he put up some, he's put up some unbelievable numbers still at an old age and really didn't show any signs of slowing down until last season. So now, do I think Patrick Kane is going to return to an elite level after undergoing very serious hip surgery? No, but I still do think he's a very capable player at the NHL level. And from seeing the the clips of him skating out there and the way that he's able to cut on his edges, and he, he really does look healthier than he has been in, in quite some time. Now, as far as where is he going to go, that's a really interesting question in of its, in of its own right as well, because you got to ask yourself, what does Patrick Kane truly want? And is it to go and win right now? Or does he, now that he has a son and is a little bit more of a family man, is he going to go and want somewhere where he can move his family for a couple of years and not just take a, a one-year deal? There are a couple of wrinkles there that Patrick Kane is going to have to figure out in terms of exactly what he's wanting to achieve this season. And you bring up a team like the Buffalo Sabres and the Detroit Red Wings. Detroit's off to a really good start. And Buffalo's the opposite, but it still feels like if he were to be wanting to chase a championship right here, right now, those aren't the ideal destinations for him. But if he's wanting a little bit more security and maybe a longer term deal, like a two or three year deal where he can, you know, go and move his family to a place, it does feel like Buffalo and Detroit would be two really intriguing options. Now, if he's wanting to go and contend, the New York Rangers and the Florida Panthers are, are two very interesting teams the one thing I will say, I kind of find it a little far-fetched that Patrick Kane, who's uh, always been playing in – Chicago was the furthest west he's really ever been. Someone who's always played up in that northeast area, and his dad's from there. His dad still goes to games. Like, I feel like Florida would be a little bit of a, of a big ask. But at that same point in time, 
there are kind of two avenues that this could go. And Patrick Kane needs to look himself in the mirror and figure out which one's more important. Is it security and going to move somewhere where he's not going to be up on the go in half a year again? Or does he want to go and win and forgoes all of those problems? If it's the latter, Florida has a little bit more legitimacy behind it. But I still do think it is a bit far-fetched. But at the same point in time, it goes to show you that it is an intriguing time to be a Florida Panthers fan. And there's a lot of buzz around this team because when you're in conversations to go and get a piece like that, you know, that's a good sign for your organization. So do I see it happening? I'm in agreement with you. I I don't think Patrick Kane ultimately winds up there, but if you were to tell Armando, if you were to tell 2019 or 2020 you that the Florida Panthers were going to be in a buzz for Patrick Kane and there might be some legitimacy around it, you'd be pretty happy about that and assume the current state of the Florida Panthers at that point in time would be pretty positive, right? Yeah, and that's before the four straight uh, years of making the postseason where they're at a crossroads right before hiring another former uh, Blackhawks coach uh, there before all that. And <laughs> and with 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 the Rangers, I'm looking at their cap friendly right now. With Even with uh, Adam Fox on, their L- on LTIR, they only have three they, – they, they're so up against the cap, and they have three open roster spots at the moment. So not a lot to choose from. And here's an, an, another intriguing team, the Dallas Stars. That, that is one team that they already had added Matt Duchesne to their, their middle six. The, the depth is there. They have the goaltender. They have a number one defenseman in Miar Haskinen who can, who can uh, move, who's th- their power play quarterback as well jason robertson he was off to a little bit of a slowish start to to start the year but he's got but he got going later on as as well and who knows if this is joe pavelski's last ride as as well the, a guy who we know as a net front presence especially during his years in san jose that could be another in, very very intriguing team uh out, out west and I'm, I, I haven't even looked at this specific team's cat friendly page, but how they're off to an incredible start as well. Uh, the Los Angeles Kings, they haven't lost a road game this year uh, and they're figuring out things with having Pierre-Luc Dubois in the long, not having to put Quentin Byfield at center and, and having his game elevate on the wing. If you have Patrick Kane on one wing and Quentin Byfield on the other, that, that could be possibly dangerous. And you spoke about out West. You spoke about the family aspect. Does he make his way out to Hollywood? That's the other thing about the Los Angeles Kings as well. That, that's interesting that you say that because uh, when I, I had a Patrick Kane update episode uh, on Lockdown Blackhawks probably two and a half, three weeks ago. And my two sleepers, my one was the Los Angeles Kings. Although, again, I do think it would be far-fetched for that to happen. Um Hollywood would be like one of those other places that would actually like do it. I think for Patrick Kane, the other sneaky team, I don't even know if they've been involved in rumors here. They certainly haven't been one of like the four, the forefront teams that are out there on the market to be in, in for him. I think the New Jersey devils, if Patrick Kane is wanting to go, I think the New Jersey devils make a ton of sense for Patrick Kane in his neck of the woods, a team that's looking like they're ready to go and take it to that next level. Those have been my two sleepers have been the New Jersey Devils and the Los Angeles Kings. And I, I certainly feel more confident about New Jersey than I would about L.A. Yeah. And, and the fact that New Jersey is currently winning without Nico Heizer and Jack Hughes in the lineup as well. That's that they're I, going into the season. I thought New Jersey, maybe a little bit too top heavy, maybe not a lot in their in their bottom six. But man, they're 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 still they're still in it. They're keeping afloat right now, even though they're currently they're currently fourth in the Metropolitan Division. You add a little bit of boost to that. We, we're not ex- you're not expecting to Patrick Kane to be at a 25 30 goal pace there. If you if you get him at a fi- even 15, like here's one player. Here's one player I actually want to compare him to, who's a little bit older and trying to get some some winning out of him. Blake Wheeler got bought out by the Winnipeg Jets. Went to New York. And and that they, they, he's been he th- that's been a player that New York has really loved having around and a leader. The that could be another that that could be another uh, that could be another team in the New Jersey Devils to bring Patrick Kane there as far as a as a player who has been there before who's won, who's also won. I know Blake Wheeler hasn't won uh, with Atlanta and Winnipeg, but still a guy who's been there for for a long time uh, in the league for a long time and knows how to lead a team. Patrick Kane could do the very same thing in New Jersey. 
one way or the other, man, I, I am fascinated because I really don't have my finger on, on one team. It feels like every option I think about, there's like a crossroads in there. Like, oh, well, would he really want to go and do that? It's going to be so interesting. And Armando, it really feels like it's probably going to be happening in the next week, if I had to guess. Like, we're getting towards Thanksgiving. He said November. We're getting towards the end of it. I expect some Patrick Kane news probably within the next seven days, my friend. Oh, yeah. And whether it's the Panthers or somewhere else, we're definitely going to be covering that uh, here on the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast. And no doubt, the three three times Stanley Cup champion uh, that, that Jack has been able to watch for many years is definitely going to be covering that there on Locked On Blackhawks. But, Jack, I want to thank you so much for doing this crossover edition with, with, with me discussing the, the, the Florida Panthers 4-3 win, a season split for, for these two teams, uh, and maybe by some, mir- by some odd miracle, maybe a Stanley Cup final, who knows, maybe between these two, some, but, but maybe. But if not, next season will be uh, – can't wait to do another crossover with you next season when these two teams meet again. But in the meantime, we will, we will definitely be chatting uh, off camera for sure through text and, and, and all that. But – before we sign off, tell everybody where they can follow you online. Yeah, absolutely. If you're interested in hearing more about the young phenom that is Connor Bedard and the Chicago Blackhawks as they embark upon this full-scale rebuild that they're now in year two of, you can go and find Lockdown Blackhawks for free wherever you may be listening to your podcast. You can check out my personal social down below at Jack Bushman too. Armando, I want to say thank you as always for having me on, my guy. I apologize for not being able to get this done until tonight, but – Again, better late than never, and really enjoy talking hockey with you, man. Thankful to have you as a friend and uh, as a colleague as well, and that we've been able to grow this relationship over the years into something pretty awesome. No, no, no doubt, my friend, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll be talking for sure, my friend. Absolutely, thank you again. And if you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to the podcast to be notified every single time the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast jumps into your podcast feed. Don't forget to also subscribe to the other shows on the Locked On NHL Network, including Locked On NHL. Locked on Fantasy Hockey with Flip Livingstone and Steel Roden and Locked on NHL Prospects. Thank you once again for making the Locked on Florida Panthers podcast your first listen of the day. So I'm Armando Velez with Jack Bushman. And you've been listening to Locked on Florida Panthers podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, where it's your team every day.